Hi again. Let's get back to it. We only have a few minutes. I've made these short so you could uh, take something small and powerful and kind of chew on it all day long. Just a thought or two, and I want you to do that. The last couple of sessions, we've been talking out of Psalm 139. I've been amazed and overwhelmed again as I look at this, at God's greatness and bigness and goodness and our smallness and almost meaninglessness. But we're the ones God loves. We are the part of His creation that He called very good. And Jesus did not die for animals and trees. He died for people. Jesus cares enough about you and me that he gave up his whole life and his glory in heaven for 33 years so that we could have his glory in heaven for eternity. So I have to remind you again that in Psalm 139, David said, the Lord searched me, he knows me. He understands me. He comprehends me. He's acquainted with all my ways. He's before me. He's behind me. And he has laid his hand on me. And then David exclaims, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. So if you've in your infinite thinking, small thinking, have tried to figure out how God could search you, know you, understand you, comprehend you, and love you anyway. You can't. Even David said, this kind of knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's beyond wonder. This kind of knowledge cannot be understood or uh, calculated in our minds. He says, it's high. This is beyond this earth. It's way past anything down here. Too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. I can't get to it. I can't wrap my hands around this God who could have made anybody, any time, who could have, who could have wiped the universe out and started all over again. Why would he give all that he is and has to have me? All right, let me turn it around. Why would God give up everything? Now, when you talk about the Father giving up everything, you're talking about Him giving up His Son. Why would Jesus give up everything? And, and you're talking about Jesus giving up this relationship with the Father and the glory of heaven. Why would God do all of that for you? Because He sees something you don't see. And he has a purpose that you don't understand. And no matter how difficult your life has been or how messy, he says God has it under control. And then he just had to say, I can't get it. I don't understand it. It's too high for me. Then he asked the question, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, listen, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Let me take a couple of moments and comment on this. Where can I go from your spirit or flee from your presence? Nowhere. God is everywhere. Everywhere present, nowhere absent. God sometimes is obvious in his ways and other times it seems that he's hidden. Do not mistake his silence for absence. Oh, he's everywhere. He doesn't always talk. You can't always see him at work, but he's there. So I, I have to remind you again, do not mistake the seeming silence of God for the absence of God because he's everywhere. Where could you go to flee from God? How can you hide from God? In the book of Revelation, when the wrath of God is being poured out during the tribulation period, it says 
the noble people, the powerful people, the slave people, <clears throat> the poor people are all crying out to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. Yes, there are people who actually think that they can cover themselves up. They can hide from God. That was the problem Adam had, and it, it just runs in our genes. Adam thought after he sinned that he, could, he and Eve could go into the weeds and hide from God. But you can't because he sees everything and he sees everybody. So David was saying, there were times in my life I'm not happy about the things I did and I hid from God. But how can you hide from the Spirit of God? Where can you flee from His presence? If you were to go up into heaven, you'd find Him. If you were to make your bed in hell, behold, you are there. You know, I've heard over the years people would say, He made His bed, now He's got to lie in it. I've had people, I think my mother even told me that one time now that I recall it. You made your bed, you got to lie in it. Meaning you made the mistake, you got to deal with it. David said, even if I make my bed in hell, God is there. He doesn't send me there to punish me. He says, if you do the wrong thing, if you find yourself in difficult circumstances, if you did it foolishly or in rebellion, God doesn't consign you to a lonely place. You made your bed, now lie in it. He says, even if I do make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. In the lowest place of my life, you are there. In the highest place of my life, you are there. So you can't hide, you can't run, <clears throat> and you don't want to once you realize the goodness of God, the keeping power, the saving grace of God. You don't want to hide from Him anymore. You want to run to Him and say, Here I am, O Lord. You know me. And I've done that. If I, in the highest place, you know, if I make, if I find him in heaven, he's there. I've certainly found him in the lowest place of my life. He was there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. In other words, if I could fly from here to the end of the world, so to speak. Even there your hand shall lead me. Wow! Here I'm doing the flying and God's doing the leading. I'm doing the running and God is doing the keeping, and your right hand shall hold me. Hallelujah. When I think I have blown it, and God is so disappointed that he has let me go my way, he says, nope, God's hand is leading me, and God's right hand is holding me. Now, you ought to grab hold of that today and have a blessed day. I'll see you next time.